copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, attention all cars, attention all Santa Clara County Sheriff cars, broadcast 123. Be on the lookout for two men who just held up the Pacific Theater in San Jose. Suspect number one described as 33 years, 5 feet 10 inches, 160 pounds, wearing a gray suit, a gray hat. Suspect number two, 20 years, 5 feet 11 inches, 150 pounds. Wearing a dark blue top coat, a brown hat. These men are believed to have escaped and afford to pay. Stand by for further details. You will be amazed how quickly the police catch the criminals in tonight's crime. Enlightened civic officials have supplied the police forces of many western cities with the newest scientific devices to fight lawbreakers, including high-powered police cars, equipped with radio and powered with Rio Grande cracks, the only Pacific Coast gasoline made by the very latest scientific Sinclair refining process. Police cars have proved that cracked gasoline develops greatest speed and power. In Los Angeles, where the police cars answer from 700 to 1,000 emergency calls every day, it takes an average of only 2 minutes and 42 seconds for a police car to reach the citizens who call for help. Police give Rio Grande Cracks gasoline full credit for making this great speed possible. And in the largest cities and counties of the West, more police and emergency cars are powered with Rio Grande Cracks than any other gasoline. This is the same gasoline you can get from the Rio Grande dealer near you. You, too, can enjoy police car performance in your own car. And now it is our pleasure to introduce Chief of Police Black of San Jose, California, who will speak to you from the studios of KFRC in San Francisco. Chief Black. Cop on the beat is a thing of the past. Nowadays, the officer who helps preserve the peace of your community rides in a high-powered patrol car, constantly in touch with headquarters by means of police radio on the dashboard. And, as is becoming more and more the case, able to communicate directly with headquarters by means of a short wave sending set in the car. Behind the officer in the radio car is all the equipment science has given to criminology. Laboratories for testing physical evidence, fingerprinting, the statewide teletype which flashes the news of a crime, and the description of the criminals over the entire state in an instant. Against such a formidable array of equipment and knowledge, how can the criminal hope to win? We who know that he never does often wonder at his stupidity in trying. The story you are about to hear is one in which the criminals attempted to enlist the most modern developments of the day to their side. But quick as they were, the police were quicker, as you soon will see. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. 
Mr. Stanley is busy, Mr. Van Duke. He can't be disturbed. Oh, okay, I'll wait. He may be tied up for some time. I'll still wait. Very well. Please, if you don't mind. Oh, sorry. Sort of hard to get along with, aren't you, girl? Huh. Oh, David. Yes, David. There's a man outside with three pies on him. Lucky guy. What will I tell him to do with it? David, you know the film goes in the projection room. It has uh, only the door locked. Oh, very well, I'll come to it. Come along, David. Well, you got to tell me own secretary. Good morning, Mr. Stanley. What? Oh, I told my secretary to tell you I was busy. You did, but you had to step out a minute, so I just thought I'd drop in. Well, I've got nothing for you. Well, now, listen, Mr. Stanley, don't be so sure about that. Look here. Take a look at this bill. That's the lobby of the Occidental in Los Angeles. I did all the cutouts and lobby cards from that long for it. Did you ever see a sweeter job in your life? That's all right. Now, look at this. The lobby of the grass. There's my shop on the 42nd Street. Yes, yes, it's all right. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Nice. I, I can take you lobby guards and design cutouts that will drag them in off the street. I can give I you the... I didn't leave. I said before that I was busy. Oh, you did. And I meant it. Now, listen to me. I don't want any lobby cards or cutouts. You get all that display stuff from the cinema display in Frisco. And I told you that the first time you came in here, and I'm tired of repeating it. Good morning, Mr. Now, now, Mr. Stanley, I can do you a better job at less go. Oh, good morning, Mr. Andrews. Oh, I don't know why I waste my time talking I to you. I don't either. I'm used to doing big jobs, not decorating the front of Tank Town show shop. You don't seem to realize who I am. Will you get out now or shall I call the police and have them escort you out? Oh, you're going to get tough, huh? All right, don't bother. I'll get out. But I won't forget this, Mr. Stanley. <laughs> Back to Los Angeles goes discouraged, unemployed, still card writer Andrews. And one day, a few weeks later, he runs into a Harvey Spangler, an acquaintance of his. Hello, Andrews. How's things? Oh, uh, not so good. How's things with you? Oh, managing to eat. That's about all. What's the matter? Are you working? No, things are slow. I've been canvassing all the theaters over the state, but I couldn't pick up much card writing. Yeah, it's tough. Didn't uh, see some good prospects, did you? What do you mean? Uh, Theaters are uh, pretty easy to knock over. Mm. Rob? Sure. You know, uh, when things are as tough as they are this winter, I figure a guy's entitled to his any way he can get it. Mm. Well, I, I haven't looked at it quite that way. That's the only way to look at it. Yeah. Well, you're right. Now you take Theaters and a sweet layout. They do business Saturday afternoon and Sunday while the banks are closed. That means that any good-sized house has got a real bankroll in the safe by the time Monday morning rolls around. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I remember when I was talking to the manager of the Pacific in San Jose, he was counting the tapes, and well, there must have been two grand spread around. The Pacific in San Jose. That's a mess. I could make us get away in the Frisco and lose ourselves before the cops wake up to answer the phone. Yeah, we could. And I got a little matter to settle with the manager of the Pacific anyway. I don't like that guy. <laughs> Just after Christmas, Spangler and Andrews drive north. In San Jose, they take a room in a hotel facing the theater. For several days, they watch the movements of the theater staff from the window. Then, shortly before noon on the 31st of December. There goes Spangler with a sack of dough. Hmm? What time is it? Quarter of 12. Hmm, it's early today. Thanks, close at noon. Oh, that's right. I forgot the day was Saturday. He never takes the door out until about 1 o'clock on weekdays. He's a day in a regular Saturday. Hmm? What do you mean? Tonight's New Year's Eve. Well, that's right, so it is. And they're having a special midnight show across the street. That ought to boost the box office receipts. Yeah. Figuring I'm knocking them over tonight? I said same not. Let them collect the Sunday take for us, too. Then we'll relieve them but Monday morning. Just before your friend, Mr. Stanley, takes it to the bank. In broad daylight? Sure, why not? Nobody around the theater at that time of day. Well, except in the porter and the secretary. Well, I handle them okay. Just at noon, the following Monday, Andrews and Spangler park their car in front of the theater. They get out and saunter across the deserted lobby. Blinking, they step from the brilliant sunlight into the chill darkness of the empty theater. 
And where do you suppose that portal is? Well, he's probably sitting up under the seat. Yeah, there he is on the side. Hey, don't call me like it's a master, Jesse. I don't want anybody to recognize him. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Porter. Yeah, Come there a minute, will you? Yeah, Remember, don't stand in here in front of these people. They might recognize your voice. Don't worry. What was it, Jim? Pick it up. Yes, sir. And keep quiet if you want to keep your health. But don't worry. I need to lose it. Okay. And lead the way to the manager's office. But I can't take you all in jail, Mr. Stanley. Yeah, I know. Busy counting the weekend receipts. And besides, he got the door bolted from the inside. Yeah, I know about that, too. And you're going to walk in there in front of our guns and knock on the door and ask him to let you in. You won't lie to What do I care? You're going to tell him you want to clean the windows in there, see? No, but I can't. Get going, on, get going. No, but I'm going to spend my shaky legs. Let me. I'll move on that old poisoner. Here we go. Okay. Knock on the door. Yeah, it's me, sir. David. Yeah. If you don't mind, Bob, I'd like to get at those windows and go. They're powerful, do they? Got to go back a little later, David. You're still in our busy right now. Tell him you've got to come in now. But I'll I'll be letting you rid. Go on. But it's a I've always been in up as a person. I'm sure we'd like to get it through the window. Oh, well, well, then. Pick him up. Oh, what? David wasn't in here. I'm sorry, sir. I couldn't help it. Yes, that was all of you. Back against the wall. Where's the toe, Mr. Stanley? Oh, I see. All counted out on the disc. Mighty nice of you. Okay, pal. Shovel that jack in up his bag. Okay. Then he looks familiar to me. Yeah. How's that? He's got a mask on. Still, he looks familiar to me. Well, he ought to. He's been shaking his joint for a week. He's been coming to the show every night to look the place over. You must have seen him in the lobby. Perhaps. But I wouldn't advise you to try to identify him. We bump guys off the neck. You know what that's all? That's Hand over your key ring. What for? Don't ask full questions. Hand it over. Very well. Here you are. I'll just keep these so you won't be able to get out of here for a while. Hold the phone. Hold the phone. Oh, yeah. Well, just make sure you don't call the cops so soon. Now you'll keep your trap shut for a while if you know what it's good for you. I'm a Quiet. Let them get away. What did you get? Don't you see? They yanked the phone on my desk, but they didn't know about this one back here in the projection room. The sheriff will be looking for them before they six blocks away. Sign a pair of sheriff's office. Just a minute, and I'll connect you. I'm ringing the sheriff. Sheriff Emmett speaking. Oh, sheriff. This is Wallace Stanley, over the city Oh, yes, Mr. Stanley. How are you? Listen, Sheriff, I've been held up. Oh, yeah? Where? Just three minutes ago. Three men came in, held up my secretary and myself, and took our weekend receipts, over $2,000. Well, can you give me a description? Well, they both wore masks. I could tell the one of them was about five feet ten. He wore a gray suit and a gray hat. The other was about an inch taller, and he had on a dark blue coat and a, a brown hat. Number one, five feet ten, wore a gray suit, gray hat. Number two, about five feet eleven, dark blue coat, brown hair. These men robbed the Pacific Theater in San Jose ten minutes ago. Cassidy, get that on the telephone to all points right away. Yes, sir. With the speed of light, the law throws an invisible net across the state of California as teletype machines in Los Angeles, in El Centro, in Eureka, and San Bernardino, in Watsonville, and San Francisco receive a description of the wanted men at the same moment. The news of their crime travels a million miles faster than the speeding getaway car in which the two robbers are roaring along the Bayshore Highway towards San Francisco. You know what I tell you? It was a pushover, wasn't it? Yeah, sure was. And by the time those birds break out of that office and tip off the law, we'll be out of the heat. Better turn to the right at this next road. There's an airport down there. Oh, okay. Hmm, there's luck. There's a ship out there on the runway warming up. And pull up by the office. Yeah. You wait in the car. Okay. Yes, sir? How much to 
supply my pardon and me into Frisco. Five dollars apiece. Okay. Got a ship ready to go? Yeah, it's that red monoplane out there. Good. Let's get a rolling. Yes, sir. Well, oh, Tom. Yeah? There's a couple of fares from Mill Field. Okay. Tom will take care of you. Fine. Now, listen. We'll leave our car here and pick it up tonight around 6. My partner and I are late for a business appointment in Frisco. Got to get this fast. Well, we'll look up here, Tom. Huh? All right. Let's go. Right. Come on, Bob. All right, sir, huh? Yeah. How long do you take to get the Frisco pilot? Here, yeah, I'll land at Millfield in 15 minutes. That's well. Hop in. guys getting to that cab over there? Yeah. Well, I just flew them over from my pa- Palo Alto. They said they were in a hurry to get to San Francisco. Said so they have been driving all night. So they left their car at the airport, and I flew them over here. Well, what's so mysterious? Well, by the time they get to town in that cab, they won't have stayed more than a few minutes. It looks suspicious. Yeah, it does, it does. I think I'll tell the boss about it when I get back to the police. Francisco Police, Boston City. This is Mr. Waters, manager of the Palo Alto Airport. Yes, sir. Strange thing occurred down here, so I think I should report to you. Yes, sir, go ahead. About a half an hour ago, a couple of men drove up to the airport and said it was a Jerry Bailey speaking. Uh, Officer Boston in San Francisco Auto Detail, sir. Yes, officer. I just received a report from Palo Alto Airport. The man who fit your teletype description of the man who robbed the Pacific Theater in San Jose he took a plane from Palo Alto to Mill Field a half hour ago. That's fine. I suggest you cover the airport in case they return for the south. I'll do that at once. In the meantime, I'll check to the south. Blue top hat, I'm here. Oh, uh, glass the police department. Right away, sir. Uh, no, no, no. I don't want a cab. I want some information. Yes, sir. Get the driver who brought two fares from Millfield in the town about three quarters of an hour ago and have him call me right away. Yes, sir. I'll try to get it from you. Out of detail, Glasson speaking. I think you've got me to this Yeah? I brought a cab for the blue car. You want to talk to him? Uh, yeah. Uh, did you bring two men in from Millfield an hour ago? Yes, sir. One of them wear a blue overcoat and a brown hat, and the other is a gray overcoat and a gray hat? Yeah, thank you. Where'd you drop them? Uh, they sent over at Hotel on Charleston. Did you overhear their conversation while you're driving them in? Uh, no, I didn't say much. I can't remember what they said. Bill of Inspector sends us to police, Lieutenant Mitchell. Lost in the order to say a lieutenant? Yes, lost in. You see the old point teletype about the San Jose Theater hold up a couple of hours ago? Yes, I got it right here in front of me. Two men who pulled that job are registered to St. Edward Hotel. Yes, sir. Would you like a room? Yes, it's a good room. Question, you know who I am, don't you? You look like you're from the police department. That's right. What is it you wanted? How long have you been on the desk? I came on duty at noon. I have two fellows sitting in a room the last two hours. One wore a blue coat and a brown hat. The other a gray coat and a gray hat. Mm, why, yes. Yeah. I think I do remember them. They're in 1005. What names did they give? Now, let's see. Robert Andrews and Harvey Spangler. Fine, right. get the house taken and come along with us. We're going to put them under arrest. Now, please don't create a disturbance. I wouldn't want to get out where it will be as quiet as I'll ever be. Lieutenant Mitchell assigns his men to cover all exits to the hotel. Then, accompanied by Inspectors Butts and Valley, and the hotel manager and house detective, he takes the elevator to the 10th floor. 
But in the meantime, a bellboy is tapping on the door of room 1005. Yes, what is it? Excuse from the valley, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. Take that time. Thank you, sir. Uh, by the way, did you expect someone? Me? No. No, why? Well, I heard somebody asking for you to death. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Here's a half a buck for telling me. Now, Scram. Yes, sir. Gee, thanks. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. Where's the fire escape? Just out there under the hall. Fine. Now, beat it, will you? Yes, sir. As Mitchell and his companions were coming up in the elevator, Potter slipped out into the fire escape and started down the outside of the building. A moment later, the officers are knocking on the door of Potter's room. Come on, open up. Apparently, he's out. Sit down to me and try the door, but it's unlocked. Yeah, you can see he's left in a hurry. That's all the trouble, gentlemen. Have you seen the guest who's in this room, Harry? Well, oh, sure. I just delivered a tip to him a few minutes ago. I told him you gentlemen were asking for You him. did? Yeah. And he gave me a 50 cent tip. I should think he would. Which way did he go? Oh, he didn't go anywhere. He just asked me where the fire escape was. The fire escape? Yes, what floor did it come out on? The third. Okay, but you stay in the room. The rest of you come along with me. We'll head him off when he gets to the bottom of the fire escape. <laughs> Back down the elevator go the officer. And as they are walking down the hall toward the fire escape on the first floor... There he is, Lieutenant. Stop climbing in that window. All right, you keep coming and don't pull no gun. I said don't pull a gun in a minute. Okay, okay. Not the cup in him, Raleigh. Right. What's your name? Harvey Taylor. Where's your partner, Andrews? I don't know. Come on back up to your room. I want to ask you some questions. By the time the officers and their prisoner returned to 1005, Inspector Butts has searched the place and found some items of interest. Well, Doc, I found the hall from the Pacific Theater. It's all here. $2,200 in cash and $500 in checks. Fine. Well, Sangler, what about it? Hmm. Looks like you're getting huh? I'd say so. Oh, okay. Yeah, I pulled it down. Where's your pal, Andrew? Why not just see his girl? Where does she live? She works in a candy store, right? Gary Street near Powell. Gary Street near Powell? What's her name? Sally, I think. Sally, candy store. Gary near Powell. Get going, Lottie. We have a special today on chocolate covered omelets. No, thanks. This will be all. Yes, sir. Can I help you, sir? Yeah. Your name's Sally. Why, yes. You're Bob Andrews' girl, aren't you? Why, uh, I know Bob. Yes. Why? I'm a friend of his. I just ran into Spangler, and he told me Bob was in town. Said you might know where I could find him. Why, is that a coincidence? Bob just left here a few minutes ago. Oh, he did, eh? Where is he going? Why, I think he was going back to the hotel. That's fine, Miss. But thank you very much. Back in room 1005, the officers are questioning their prisoner when the phone rings. I'll get it. No, wait a minute. That might be Andrews. You answered, Spangler, and don't give him off the word here. What, what did I say to him? Get him, sugar. Get him back up here. I asked him to double cross my time. We're telling you what to do if you don't want any more trouble. But get on the extension in the other room. Yes. Now go ahead, Spangler, and play safe. Yeah. Okay. Hello? What's the idea? What have you asked for? All right. I was asleep. Yeah? Well, stay away. Bring it out of the heat, Jack. I know it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Where are you? I'm down in the locker. I'll be right. You're ready to check out. I'm ready. Right now. Well? Downstairs. I'll be right up. How about a bus? Did he cross us up? Uh, be played straight, all right. A wise boy. What I can't figure out is how you guys caught up with us. We knocked that joint over only three hours ago, and we never get away in an airplane. Listen, Potter. You can't beat the law. As fast as you think you can get away, we can be better ahead of you. You see, you're in the crime business on a small scale, and we're in the business of catching you on a large scale. With expensive equipment, radio, telepath, and so on. And we've got a nationwide organization. You can't beat us. Looks like you're right. Well, here's our friend. Pick him up, Andrew. What is it? You're under arrest. Oh. So that's the kind of a pal you are, Frank. Lead me into a trap like this. Ah, I couldn't help it, Bob. They had guests on me. Nothing we can do about it anyway. The coppers are too quick for it. <laughs> Within an hour, Sheriff Emig is on his way back to San Jose with his prisoner. The next day, Andrews and Spangler, having pled guilty and waived preliminary hearing, are standing before the judge in Superior Court. Both 
The States versus Robert Andrews and Harvey Spangler, Harvey versus Van Lockney. How do you please, gentlemen? Oh. Guilty. Guilty. And judge. Yes? Get it over with as soon as possible, will you? With pleasure. It is the sentence of this court that you be confined to San Quentin Penitentiary for from five years to the rest of your natural life. Next case. Within a little more than 24 hours after they had robbed the Pacific Theater, Andrews and Spangler were entering the grim portals of San Quentin Penitentiary, dazed by the sudden turn of their fortune but not two days to realize that crime doesn't pay. The new Calling All Cars News is out today, and we urge you to go to your nearest Rio Grande service station and ask for your free copy. The news tells you more about the cases you hear on these broadcasts. And it illustrates some brand new free gifts for boys and girls. Every time you go to a Rio Grande station, you can help some youngster get a G-man or a junior detective outfit. Nearly every listener to this program realizes that the outstanding gasoline value in this market is Rio Grande Crest. But not all of you know that every Rio Grande dealer now features Sinclair motor oil because they unquestionably give you more value for your money. All useless wax and valueless petroleum jelly has been removed from Sinclair motor oil. You get nothing but pure oil. No waste. No filler. More lubrication for your money than ever before.